Steve, welcome. I hope that the technicalities will be with us. As you can see here, he's the global industry architect of Microsoft, and he uh, is joining us if, every, if all the, the technicalities want to uh, work with us. You're free to already project him on the screen. So, Steve, great having you here. The room can see you. So without further ado, I would uh, invite you to give us your opening address. Thank you very much, Steve. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. And well, hi everyone. My apologies for not being there in person, but uh, hopefully we can have a, a you know enjoyable um, um, session and then uh, rest of the day. So just as an introduction, my name is Steve Butcher. I'm an industry architect with uh, Microsoft Industry Solutions. My role is very much working across our top FSI accounts on their digital transformation. So uh, it's an absolute pleasure to to present to you today. So today I'm just going to sort of give an overview of what we see in the market, especially around the sort of the digital banking and banking platform as a service in the context uh, of the, the digital financial summit. So to sort of begin, and, and obviously these areas are no doubt, uh, no surprises here, really the, the areas that we see accelerating the change in financial services. So over the last few years, the changing customer expectations, disintermediation, different channels, et cetera. But really a massive focus on the customer journey, both from a retail perspective, so consumers driving that change, uh, SMB and business banking looking to create ways of growing their business and surviving the, the difficulties and the challenges we have, the difference between the different generations of customers from this shift of non-traditional through to this sort of customer engagement and, and all of the areas you see here around sort of risk and really sort of thinking about cyber as well. Cyber is becoming more and more prevalent and making much more impact across the landscape of financial services. So the way in which we think about this or the way in which we see the massive innovation is really sort of we separate into these three segments. So the first one being around the sort of client engagement and client engagement could be again from a, a relationship manager perspective, engaging with the business bank. It could be through the contact center, through the bar branch, or many other different models, even through digital assistance and conversational AI and banking that we're starting to see um, surface. But most of the areas are really around sort of hyper-personalization. So how can you truly understand the behavior, the profile, the needs of the customer, and address that through a personalized and tailored experience in the form of banking services, but also non-banking services that we'll cover in a moment. The second piece is the enablement of that through the colleague journeys. So again, providing the richest customer insights for the ability to deliver those services to our customers, to create the next best action or next best conversation to fulfill those needs of customers, to create that single customer view, 360 or 70 degree view, so we truly understand. And of course, the third segment is around the modernization or the technology enablement of that. And for some customers, that's around looking at their legacy and creating APIs and externalizing those products and services through open banking and through other models that we'll discuss and then layering digital experiences on top of legacy. And for some, it's about creating a completely new digital platform to serve the needs of new customers. That might be the digital youth, the millennial, uh, a new business banking proposition. And for those, it's about exploring what are those next gen plat uh, platforms that can be used? How can we cl be cloud native? be API driven and be data at our core. So these are really the three segments that we see most innovation and digitalization and be the focus of the, the next, uh, this particular session. I'd like to use this slide to really sort of reinforce the, the two areas that we see as a sort of underlying thread, if you will. So the first one is this shift from being product centric, especially in the banking space, creating products that are matching other competitors in the form of the transactional nature, the loan to value or whatever the characteristics might be to being experience centric. And ultimately, how can we empower the lifestyle of our customers, support life events that may be planned or unplanned, and also in the same situation, 
create and support and empower businesses to really sort of grow through these difficult times. So the way to illustrate this is through this slide here that sort of describes the layers uh, that enables this, uh, these solutions and this digitalization. So going from bottom to top, first of all, we've got data as a service. How can we gather as much data as possible about the individual or about the business? So for an individual, this might be payments data, transactional data, travel information, mobile airtime. We've even got customers where we're looking at sort of non-conventional ways of understanding the customer and defining what their risk profile and credit profile might be in the form of serving the uh, underbank and the underserved in that space. In the context of business, it might be integration with ERP systems, integration with account package information together with that payment. So again, we can not just understand the business, but also the interactions that business occurs in the real world. That data as a service will feed into the insights that allows us to better understand the needs of that organization or that customer. Maybe it might be through promotions and um, offers from a marketplace of retailers or merchants. It might be promotions and offers from partners of the bank that provide products and services beyond what the bank provides. And all of this starts to come together in a sort of robo-advisory and automation especially in the context of where you have a legacy platform. For some customers, as we said at the beginning, it's about building out a brand new digital core. It might be on a Mambu, a Thought Machine, or an SAP or similar, or it might be just an extension of the legacy. And what we're starting to see is the evolution of this. So meaning for some traditional banks have created sort of sub-brands, if you will, and we've got a few examples later. But now what we're starting to see is customers starting to think about true modernization. How can we create a new modern banking platform that is going to be our new go-to core? Then sitting on top of that or complementing it is around sort of ecosystem management. So how can we have an ecosystem of partners that even create a new revenue model through referrals and through other models? How could we even connect or match, make, or broker our business-to-business -business services to, again, allowing them to grow and surface that through an intelligent data-driven marketplace. And then finally, it, that might be brought together through a mobile digital experience, a bot, as an example, creating a digital assistant through APIs as well, creating third-party opportunities. But these are really the core components or the core layers that bring together that connected digital banking experience. So in the context of that, we really see four areas that customers pursue when we work with customers. So on the top left, you've got the act like a challenger, so born of the cloud, building from the ground up your digital proposition. And we've got some great examples of customers that we were working with. So ClearBank is a very good example in the UK that built from the ground up clearing and payment settlement services and continue to extend their services to customers. And in a moment, we'll give you some examples of retail banks that we've worked with. And again, this continues to evolve from being a born of the cloud and creating a rich set of services. On the bottom left, you've got the sort of modernization. So again, how do you sort of take your log legacy that's been around for many, many decades and have evolved from being a telesystem to ATM to online banking to mobile banking, and now the ability to compete with the digital players. So two areas that we certainly look at is really the sort of transformation through a set of APIs and deeper partner collaboration. Microsoft has a very broad and comprehensive ecosystem of partners on both our Azure and Dynamics platform and extending out to teams that creates that end-to-end -end customer experience. So just to give you a few examples of how this comes together. So the first one is Creditor Agricola. Creditor Agricola is one of the large banks in Portugal. And a few years ago, we did an open banking implementation. We worked with them to externalize some of their products and services from their legacy through an API set, creating a secure channel or model for accessing those external services 
and also uh, integration to their legacy. From that, we created a digital bank called Moe. So Moe is a digital bank that's purely focused on the millennial market, on the digital youth. It has a very distinctive and unique uh, user experience, as you see here, this sort of cartoon-esque model. But it's really its purpose is around creating gamification and different AI models for incentivizing savings to create group savings and individual models that brings them together to sort of create and enable that. And we continue to work with CA and with MOE about how we can extend the capabilities across the landscape. And again, looking at sort of retail marketplaces and other areas. The second one is Floe. So Floe is different from MOE because MOE is leveraging the existing legacy core banking of uh, uh, Credit Agricola. Floe is a completely separate platform that we co-created with Terminos and using data and AI to create a truly different platform that has a ethos and focus around sustainability. So the sustainability aspect is really what differentiates the platform. So what you can see here is this sort of, again, this unique user experience with the greens and purples. It has a biodegradable card, again, in line with the, the ethos of sustainability. The platform and the, and the proposition is completely carbon neutral. But most importantly, it's a great example of a data-driven bank. We deeply analyze every single transaction that's made within the context of the platform to surface to the end user their personal carbon footprint. What we also ask for is we try to gain consent from the end user of their uh, fitness information, whether that be Google Fit or similar. And again, we use the data and AI capabilities to aggregate that data to surface to the end user their personal wellness. So combining sustainability with their personal wellness. And then to complement that, the third part of the platform is a lightweight uh, video content platform. And that's used to deliver uh, insights and education and awareness from social influencers, which help to accelerate the adoption and the usage of Splow A, but also for partners around sustainability. And the reason why it's such a good example is the banking and transactional nature of the platform is to a certain degree a lesser priority and lesser focus to the end user. It's all about the personal wellness and the sustainability. And again, Floe is a, not just a customer, but a partner of ours where we're seeking to explore how can we continue to innovate on the platform, deliver new and exciting features to the end user, but also how can we extend it maybe beyond retail and into the business segment. So again, this is just sort of two examples of how we can bring together the customer experience, the client enablement, and also the, the, the platform. And so just to sort of finish off, we must consider that it's not just about the technology. It's about creating and harmonizing the business transformation and thinking about what's the strategy and the direction of the organization and at the same time, creating this, this growth culture. So how can we innovate inside the organization and outside and enable sort of rapid innovation and experimentation on these new models? So it's been an absolute pleasure to, to introduce this topic. I'm going, going to be participating in the panel uh, sessions later, but would, um, if there's the opportunity, would uh, love a few minutes to sort of take some questions and answers. Otherwise, we'll hand over to the next presenter. We actually don't have the feedback set up yet, but we will collect questions and keep sending them through the app while we have the, the panel that will follow on the next uh, speakers. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Victoria Brunyard from IBM. We've just had the future of banking, and you say the future has arrived, right? So <laughs> that's a nice continuation. Floor is all yours, and we look forward to those insights. Thank you. Um, good morning, and I absolutely have to echo the, how great it is to just see you all in person and to see real people kind of from not just from the neck up. So absolutely great to see you all here today. And 
100%. What I want to talk to about a little bit is the future of banking. And when I started to think about this, when I was first asked to talk about this, what really struck me was the future of banking is already here. It arrived on the wings of the pandemic, and this accelerated our digitization journeys at unprecedented rates. And there just is no sign of a slowdown. What we've seen is the estimates are kind of five, six, seven years ahead of where we expected to be without the kind of activity that we've had to go through in the last two years. And for the last two years, a lot of us have just been hanging on for the ride. But that's not enough. And so as a sector, simply to survive this pandemic is just, it's just not enough. We're the engine of, of people's innovation. We're the engine of businesses. We're the engine of organizations. And so we need to work out how do we thrive. And if you're familiar with the work of uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, he wrote The Black Swan uh, and Anti-Fragile. We need to take what we've learned in the last two years and turn it into a blueprint for our anti-fragile future. And so, when you listen to him, the essence of anti-fragility is going beyond resilience. And if we think about resilience as being our ability to weather the storm, this idea of anti-fragility is about saying, I'm not just going to weather the storm. I'm going to let the storm drive me forward. I'm going to take all of that energy. I'm going to embrace it. And I'm going to let it propel me into the next phase, into the next steps. And so we were really thinking hard about this at IBM and trying to understand what are the things that take you to that anti-fragility space? What are the things that will help you as an organization drive forward and be successful? And what we decided was that the smart way to find out was actually to go and talk to the leaders of our, of our clients, the leaders of organizations, the leaders of global businesses um, worldwide. And so what we did was we talked to 3,000 CIOs, CEOs, so 3,000 chief execs in businesses across the world. And we learned some really interesting things. And one of the things that we learned was actually those organizations who are being successful through the pandemic are quite often those organizations that were successful before. And so we see that there are characteristics that come out of a particular type of organization, a particular way of thinking, which is helping to carry them through this, this period. And so what we learned, what we heard from those 3,000 execs were three elements that are really essential to not just surviving, but really thriving in these uncertain times. And so the first was really performing with purposeful agility. And, and this comes back to something, in fact, I was talking to Audrey about a little bit before we started, where this event is a really good example of this. We, you know, there was a risk that we were gonna have to stop. We're still going ahead. We've had to make some adjustments, but we had a purpose and, and we're driving forward and we're being agile and we're changing the way that we approach things as we go forward. And, and this, this theme came through very strongly, this idea of, purposeful agility and not simply to try to follow everything and try to change everything and try to adapt to everything, but to really get that concrete focus on these are the things that we want to achieve and, and this is the kind of agility that we need in order to be able to achieve those. Second thing that came through was about making tech matter more. And this for us was really interesting because we are at our heart a technology company and um, we think tech matters a lot. And we see in the banking industry, we see in the financial industry, tech is huge right now. You're all driving after your digitization journeys. You're, you're increasing that level of technology usage. But interesting was this theme around making it matter more. And again, this came back to this idea of focus. So this idea of really having this, this laser focus on what are you trying to achieve, what are you trying to do, and really making the technology support those goals, those, 
outcomes, those activities. And, and this always seems a little bit, well, obvious, really, but, but sometimes it's good for us to just take a moment and think, no, no, why am I doing this? Why am I using this technology? What is the direction that I want it to take me in? Third thing which was really interesting for us was the idea of embracing emerging technology. And I think that will come out more and more through today. And so I remember that, you know, emerging technology is something in the past where we were, oh, there are new regulations, there are new changes to the regulations, there are more things coming through that we have to think about, and that's blocking. And in fact, what we heard from these 3,000 chief execs was, was to flip that script a little bit and think, no, no, these emerging regulations are an opportunity for us. And in fact, putting good boundaries around what we're trying to do allows people to innovate in, in really good, strong ways. And in fact, there is a, a, a piece of learning which is innovation is driven by constraint. And so by only by understanding what the box looks like, are we able to really think outside the box and innovate and bring new ideas and bring new things forward. So those three key elements were what came at us from our 3,000 chief execs on, on how are we going to thrive, not just survive. And really interestingly, I think from a banking perspective, what came through from our, our banking execs was this translates into three different elements. And, and we've talked already a little bit this morning about reshaping that customer experience, rethinking that customer experience. What I thought was really interesting going through things like Money 2020 and Cybos and the COP26 in recent um, weeks is st starting to think about the branch again and what is the purpose of the branch and what is the use of the branch and how is that part of our digitization journey. And so really reshaping that customer experience and, and again, thinking in very different ways about what that means is part of that process driving forward. And as was mentioned already today, fintechs have a huge part to play in that because that is where that rethinking comes from in many cases. Second thing was about rad radically restructuring operational models and really thinking about how do we do what we do. Because in fact, what we see coming through from these conversations is it's not always the regulation that's blocking or in fact the technology that's blocking. Quite often it's just the way that we do what we do. And so how do we think, rethink those operational models to make them support how we do our digitization and how we interact with our customers, and then how do we drive that journey forward? So operating models are increasingly important in this ongoing digitization. And then um, Carl already mentioned it this morning, so the whole piece around security, data protection, and compliance, that's huge. And cracking that particular nut is going to be a massive part of being successful in, that, in this future banking world. And so those are kind of the key things that we learned through the study. What I think is really interesting and why I also am, you know, of the opinion that the future of banking is already here. It's already arrived because the technologies that we need are already here. They've already arrived. The whole cloud story, but perhaps particularly in banking, more importantly, the hybrid cloud story where we think about our technology landscapes rather than just our individual elements, that's already here. The analytics, the machine learning, the AI capabilities, they're already here. The blockchain capabilities that were mentioned earlier, it's already here, we're already using those. Quantum computing, okay, to a more limited extent, but the announcement from two weeks ago where we're now up to 100 qubits in our quantum computing environment, this is so exciting for us. So these technologies are already here, and if we go into security and compliance, post-quantum cryptography, zero trust, fully homomorphic encryption, confidential computing, these, these capabilities are already here. So the future of banking, it's here. We have everything that we need to do this well, and everything that we need to drive forward and to drive to 
new and exciting customer models and new and exciting ways of thinking about the industry. And my call to action would be, just do it. And come and talk to us at the booth to understand why we're showing you pictures of puppies. Because the key is, technology isn't everything that we're doing right now. So come and talk to us about some of the thinking. But my, what I would encourage you to do right now is just to embrace these technologies and drive after these new models. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victoria. Here's a little gift to take to that booth. And while we're th talking about those booths, there's lots of startups and other exciting technology companies presenting their products. And so if you don't just want to uh, suffer from the crisis, but thrive and survive, as you just said, uh, the next speaker is an example of that. Uh, Marc Lainé was a, one of the founders of an exciting open banking startup that was acquired by the Isabel Group. So if you want to speed up your innovation, Look at talented teams such as Marks, how to integrate that sort of fast in innovation into your cor lar larger corporate. So without further ado, we look forward to see what Mark is going to share with us this year. Also knowing that he's been on the stage, I think, in almost all of the previous sessions. So we can see how PZ2, is it finally happening? Um, <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's not, oh, that's not a yes. about Okay, PSD2. we're going to listen to that now, Mark. Big yes. thanks. <laughs> But I cannot agree more with the two previous speakers, and, and actually my presentation is specifically about this, uh, PSD2 and the open banking, why do we care? So basically trying to figure out why do we actually do this, why do we keep going? And, and when, I was, uh, when I was discussing the topic of my talk, I thought, okay, let's look back a little bit indeed at the, the past two years, and a little bit more than the past two years, actually, because uh, PSD2 came into force in September 2019. And the question was, okay, how, how was it? What, what did it look like? And, and what kept us going? Because it felt a little bit at some moments like, like a little bit of a fight, you know, between regulators, banks, TPPs, and we're always still discussing about what should, what should be uh, an interpretation of this or that and all that. And, and in the end, it's, it's, it struck me the question, why? Why do we keep doing this, right? What, what's, what's really the, the purpose of all that? And, and, and the way the, the European Commission uh, says it, it's, it's all about modernization and more competition and making things safer, but it, it still doesn't really uh, describe why uh, actually people like me or maybe like you actually got into this in the first place. Uh, why did we actually start, uh, uh, start, start growing there? Now, looking back at the past two years, and we've covered this already, uh, it's clear that uh, before the pandemic, we were already talking about a VUCA world, like a volatile, uncertain, a complex and ambiguous world. Uh, it's clear that it's become even more like this and goes faster and faster. I think the two speakers uh, previously have, have, have made it pretty clear. Uh, but so it, it, it got to the point, especially during the pandemic, where people got, uh, you know, lost their, their source of income, which is a pretty <laughs> serious deal. Uh, also, companies starting to, to be in trouble as well. Um, uh, just this quote from Graydon, it's, it's in French in the original article, but, but what they basically say is that uh, they see that about 200,000 companies that had a financially sound situation before the pandemic are now into trouble. So it doesn't mean that we saw an explosion of bankruptcy uh, last, uh, in the last few months in Belgium, but, but this is a pretty s serious quote, in my opinion, that shows that uh, making financial decisions today uh, it's become even more difficult than before, and that for a lot of companies or a lot of people, it feels a little bit more like, like rolling the dice than making an actual uh, decision. I mean, just a quick example, if you, if you were a nightclub owner two weeks before and you started investing in buying auto tests, and then a few days later you're told that you have to close off a week later, I mean, this is a huge investment you made, and and, and in the end, there's no, no return on investment for you. So the uncertainty is becoming more and more of a problem. And, and pandemic or not, this is not going to stop. That's, that's for sure. And so it's, it's becoming increasingly important to, for businesses and consumers to know all the situation and all the parameters they need to take care of uh, before making a financial decision. So the thing that got me into this in the first place, and, and I hope that for some of you that's the same story, uh, it's really this ability to provide better and safer financial decisions for everyone everywhere. 
and all the words actually matter. So it needs to be better. It needs to be more uh, closer to, to your environment. It needs to be uh, to embed also your values into the decision. It needs to be safer. I, I, would, I would be surprised if I found anyone in this room that said, no, no, we don't want safer uh, financial decisions or transactions for people. I think this is something we, we need to thrive for and continue to thrive for. What, what, what it means also indeed is that, uh, and we saw also from the examples from Microsoft, but also the discussion here that, that uh, or the examples that, 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 that were given by IBM, that the, the values and, and, and why do you actually take that decision and how, how, does it actually, um, how, does, how does it actually match your values and your principles matters most. So when, when we talk about redefining, I would say those, uh, those, those financial services and, and designing better and safer financial decisions, uh, we talked about redesigning the customer journey, right? Uh, and I, I, can, I can only strongly agree with this. We need to really rethink the way we see banking services. Today, and, and what you see that in PSD2 and open banking, it's a lot about we take something that we know, we take a financial process that we know, and we digitalize it, right? So we just take what's existing, we make it online or through an API and whatever but we don't really change the way it works. We don't really change how it's delivered. We, we just create a new channel. But, but what, we're, what we need to do is really review entirely how we deliver those services and how they actually get closer to the moment of the decision. Because if you want to take a very good financial decision in today's world, you need to get all the information you need at the moment, the decision needs to be taken, not one week after or two weeks after or after you've talked to your banker and all of that. It needs to be the closest possible to the moment the decision needs to be taken. If you see a car in the street, and I know it's not necessarily the best example, but you see a car in the street and you ask yourself, can I afford it? The answer should come immediately. You should not have to wait that long to know if you can afford a car or not. Uh, the same goes for businesses. If you need to buy a new piece of machinery and you're in a, in a meeting room, you need to know at this exact moment if you can buy it. it. Because if you wait one week, one month, two months, it may be a completely different context and you may take uh, the wrong decision in the end. So when we talk about redesigning uh, customer journeys, I cannot help but think about this, uh, this book, Don't Make Me Think. It's about user experience. And uh, the author, Steve Krug, basically says that nothing important should ever be more than two clicks away uh, in a product. All right? so, and it got me thinking a little bit. When I, the last time I had to make a financial decision, uh, was the information I needed two clicks away or was it much further? And the answer usually is that it requires a lot more work, a lot more effort from the consumer or, 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 or the person in a company to actually get that information. So we really need to rethink all of this and get inspired also by how how we reviewed customer journeys in other types of industries. Uh, one way that I like to, to also wrap my head around uh, the, this idea of customer experiences is that Tim Cook didn't really say Apple is, is a software company. He said Apple is not a hardware company. Uh, so the, the thing is that uh, if you go to the, to the street and ask people what they think about when you mention the word Apple, they're, they're probably going to tell you the, the iPhone, the iPad, and whatnot. So a hardware device, right? The truth is that Apple makes more money on software than they do on hardware. They make a lot of money on the app, the app store, actually. Uh, and and it's, it's an interesting thing because they see the, the hardware device as the beginning of a relationship, not like the end of a relationship with a customer. Uh, and it's also something interesting to, to, to look at how we can think about this in, in the banking world. Uh, you see banks uh, selling electric bike loans, but not selling electric bikes. Now, I'm not saying you should do that, but maybe there's a rethinking about, reframing about how you build those services and what you should actually uh, deliver. <clears throat> so the goal to me is really about a banking, uh, embedding banking into the existing customer journey and stop trying to drive them into another app, yet another app, yet another fintech or whatever. So, because in the end, what we see with neobanks and all of that is that, yes, it provides a new customer experience, but still in another uh, journey in a completely different uh, landscape. So to me, really, the idea of trying to embed really this banking experience in the customer journey that already exists today is, is really critical to the future. 
Just to give you, I know this is, it, it, what I'm saying may sound a little bit abstract, but I built myself a small uh, browser extension because, you know, this famous uh, question of can I afford it? I have that all the time. I, I do, uh, especially during the pandemic, more and more online uh, shopping, I would say. And sometimes it's always a question, okay, can I afford this? And we cannot request all of the merchant to start integrating uh, banking services or connecting to my banking app, right? So the question is, hey, why don't we just integrate all of this at the browser level? So really the way your web browser works is that it could simply see what you're actually doing and give you insights straight away, two clicks away. So literally you click on the icon, you say, what can I afford? And then it's your actual web browser that just shows you the items you can afford. You don't need to think, you don't need to open your app. Now, again, this is not a breakthrough. Eh? This is not a, a critical thing that will change the world, but it's really trying to think about how we can put those services, those banking services, simple uh, banking services, in the existing customer journeys without disrupting them. Now, this, this extension could also, or at least this product, could also tell me that I cannot afford it now, but maybe two weeks from now I can actually afford it and make me come back or do something like this. So it's really just, in my opinion, PSE2 and open banking are the foundations that are starting to bring these kinds of use cases and these kinds of embedded finance uh, possible at scale. Um, and that's something that I'm actually pretty excited about, to be honest, and I build those things for myself in my spare time. Um, so when, we, when I said we got into this to, to have better and safer financial decisions for everyone every, everywhere, I mean that it's not just about creating the next cool app. It's also about really looking at how we can bring that information and bring that decision power to the moment the decision needs to be taken and not weeks or months later. So my name is Mark, I'm from Isabel Group, and I'm going to be at the booth also for a big part of the day if you want to talk to us about what we do and uh, those crazy ideas that we have. Thank you very much. We now have a panel, oh. so you can stay on stage for the panel, if I'm not mistaken. Or uh, no, I'm not in the panel. You're not in the panel, then you I have to get out. Yeah, yeah, Sorry yeah. about that one. Yeah, Sorry about that one. I'm going to look for Xavier Corman, who's going to normally, if my planning is uh, right, or are you doing this, Xavier? Paul? Okay. I'm, no, I'm a, there's a mix up here, because in my planning, it still has the other Xavier. So, Xavier, can you confirm me who's. Is this Xavier, our former president of the nonprofit? Xavier de Pau, please come on stage. I have an error in my uh, lead here, but so welcome. I let you introduce the other panelists. Yeah. They all get a microphone on stage there. So all the best to you. Thank you. I'm still using some paper. Uh, shouldn't, shouldn't be doing. Uh, thank you. Um, no, it's, it's great to be. Um, it's great, great to be, first of all, on stage. It's, for, it's great to be back at, uh, at Fintech Belgium, which we indeed uh, co-set up um, six, six, seven years ago now. Um, so we, we, have a, we have a very interesting task to, to talk about the future of banking, the future of finance. Um, very, really fantastic introductions with the, the, the previous speakers, which I think we can build on. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll ask the, the, the speakers maybe one by one to, to, to come on. Um, ladies first, uh, Karin Goris. Uh, Karine is uh, Chief Security Officer at uh, Belfius. She's also um, the Chair of the Security uh, Advisory Board at Fabelfin. Uh, and we heard uh, the CEO of Fabelfin earlier talk about security, so that's, a, that, that's definitely a topic. Um, Karine also lectures at, at Solvay School um, of Economics and, and, and Management. Uh, second lady, uh, Gabriela Omolova. Um, strong international expertise in business management and consultancy, co-founder of at least two fintechs, uh, Birza and Drebel. Uh, looking forward to your views on, on, on the fintech sector. Um, we have, we, we at some point should have Steve Butcher, uh, whom you, you heard earlier. Uh, he should be joining us digitally, uh, hopefully, uh, from South Africa. Um, good, good, uh, there he is. Hey, Steve. Um, I'll, I'll reintroduce you for, for those of you who were not in the room. Um, Steve is global industry architect at Microsoft. Uh, he really deals with um, digital transformation for Microsoft's uh, most important, most strategic financial services clients. Um, 25 plus years experience in, in the sector, so really looking forward to, to, to hearing some of your views, Steve. Um, we have Marc Toredo uh, on, on the panel, serial entrepreneur, uh, following a successful 
um, story with, with Toledo Telecoms, uh, co-founder of Bit4U, the first Belgian crypto exchange, and now also um, MD at BAX, which is uh, short for the Blockchain Association of Exchanges um, and Custodians. So looking forward to your views on, on blockchain, which has been discussed before. And then finally, uh, Ramsey, uh, welcome, uh, Ramsey Ziri, uh, Open Banking Product Manager at LuxHub. Um, more than 10 years of experience in startups, uh, in, in mainly in Germany, um, especially on, on the payment and the e-platform side. Can I check, is, is, uh, is Steve connected, hearing us? Yep, I'm sure. here. I can see you on the screen there, oh, you can see you there. Okay, great. Um, look, we, we had, um, so we had Steve, we had, we had speeches from IBM, uh, Mark, always super inspiring to, to, to hear. Um, we, look, we, we're here to talk about the future of banking and the future of finance. We can wildly uh, you know, come up with theories of what that future could look like. What, what we thought we would do is talk about, um, as was mentioned before, the future is quote unquote already here. Uh, let's look at what we are working on because that really defines the path of, of where the sector is going. Uh, and let's start with that introduction, maybe. Um, so, so you know, Steve, what, what, what I found interesting is big tech uh, companies are helping banks, financial institutions. Um, we saw Google going into banking, then officially announcing that they're, they're out of banking. What is the role of, of big tech um, in, in that transformation um, of, of, of the sector, and where is it leading towards? So uh, it very much sort of extends upon uh, what we've discussed and the, myself and the three other presenters have gone through. We've seen this, this big evolution from just being very transactional banking through you know, online banking, mobile banking, to this new digital experience model that is not just about the, you know, the, the financial transactions themselves, but extending that to a wide variety of services as per the, the, the last comment, you know, making two clicks away, understanding the needs of those customers. And of course, cloud platforms and that rich set of comprehensive services are really making that um, possible in an accelerated time frame that, that we've never seen before. So we've got customers where we've literally built digital banks in under sort of seven to nine months. So we've seen cloud platforms and those technologies really accelerate that and organizations like ourselves being part of that transformation for our customers. Okay, great, great. Uh, maybe to pick up on that, you mentioned building a bank in seven to nine months. I think I picked that up. Um, when, I, when, I, right? when, I, when I see, um, when I see when we're, we're building a startup in a FinTech startup in the UK, yes, I, I echo that. You, can, you have now banking as a service. So you can, you can set up a bank in, in almost no time uh, with relatively limited uh, capital. Um, what, what does that mean um, in, in terms of, of, of the landscape? Does that mean that we're going to have lots of small banks emerging, niche banks emerging um, you know, go, 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 going forward? Is, 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 that, is that the future of banking? I um, I, I, possibly. I mean, I think that... that um, you know, I think it's more about bank, you know, banks evolving, especially traditional ones, being able to compete with the, the digital players, but much more in a partnering sense. So looking at open banking and other models, bringing those together to create a complementary set of services is more likely to be what we'll see. Okay, thanks. Any, anybody else wants to comment on that? I think. <laughs> is it one? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, jumping on the point, uh, collaboration, I think, is key um, for the future of banking, um, whether it's a forced collaboration by directives like the PSD2 or just uh, proactive collaboration from banks. I think um, whether it's also uh, in terms of materializing efforts, investments in certain technologies or certain uh, schemes, or also collaboration to bring new value proposition to market. Uh, I think if we look at the European market, to take the payments, for example, um, the more collaborative the banking scene is, the sort of um, payment solution standard will ev will emerge and uh, will present a, a great user experience. So um, that is, I think, key uh, one of the keys, at least, for the future of banking. Okay, thank you. Now, wh when um, 
when, when, when we started FinTech Belgium a long, a long time ago, the, the FinTech sector wasn't, wasn't that well known yet. Uh, tech, the big tech sector was certainly already in, 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 the, in the financial sector. Um, we heard you know, a, a couple of big, we heard Steve and, and IBM before that. Um, Gabriela, you deal a lot with, with the smaller FinTech startup scale-ups. Um, as a former bank CEO, it, it's easy to engage with a large tech company because you can convince your board, your regulator, how, how are smaller companies, uh, fintechs, scale-up startups dealing with that? Not very, not very easy, I have to say. Mm. We have been around for 10 years now, and it is not easy um, to talk to big uh, banks, even though your product is proven to work. Um, you go through all the tests, proof of concepts, but still it's very difficult uh, for whatever reason it is, but it uh, would be good to open the collaboration, um, perhaps through the bank as a service, mm -hmm. and also for the banks it can be additional revenue stream, so the whole concept can be a win-win situation for everybody. Um, and I have to say that with respect to the banks, they are certainly stronger on regulatory point of view, um, but uh, fintechs are more cost customer focused. And I'd like to give you a recent example of onboarding and customer experience. Um, a previous speaker also mentioned um, the importance of that. We as a company were opening a business bank account and uh, we had digital bank and we had traditional, one of the largest bank in, uh, in Europe. And digital bank uh, was able to do it fully digitally. We didn't have to go anywhere using all kinds of um, uh, technologies like uh, face recognitions and so on. But the traditional bank literally asked us to come in person to be validated. And therefore, the whole onboarding and KYC experience turned into kill your customer experience because we did not open the bank account. We walked away, of course, because we would not fly all shareholders to the bank to show their faces. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, we, we just launched a company, so it's, uh, it's an experience I can recognize. Um, look, as I said, I've, I've been on both sides of the equation. I've, I've, um, I've been... In, in banks, uh, on the executive side, I've, I've, I've been on the entrepreneurial. I am on the entrepreneurial side, so I understand both sides and, and both challenges. Um, ultimately, it comes down also to accountability, regulation, the impact of regulation. Right? Uh, who, who is accountable if something goes wrong? Um, Karin, you, 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 as, as the uh, responsible for, for security at, um, at Belfius and, and also within the wider sector of, of uh, Fablefin. What, what, do you, what do you think of, of this? How is this accountability, which is still with, with the banks, how is that impacting the, the, the evolution um, and, and the, the, the image of a bank in the future? Yeah, um, first of all, I want, uh, I want to make it straight that banks uh, will need to open up, that they will need to break the boundaries around them. Um, not only going to the cloud, but also like our previous speaker said uh, regarding PSE2, we have to open up uh, towards fintechs to, to, to stay innovative and, and, and to other partners. So that's something which, is, which will be our future. But that means that brings, of course, like you say, a lot of challenges. Mm. First of all, um, opening up uh, this bank, this technology, technological bank, uh, which was quite a fortress, is, is a challenge by itself. So um, we have to rethink our defense in depth strategy and, and go uh, beyond that strategy and, and reinvent ourselves on the technological level. And secondly, like you mentioned it all, last, uh, the last couple of years, we are quite uh, regulated. We have uh, DORA, we have EBA guidelines, we have SWIFT requirements, and uh, we have GDPR, so, and, and I'm sure I, I forget uh, about some. Um, so we have uh, quite some strict regulations where we have to apply to, but um, that also, like the previous speaker said, creates openings and creates openings towards collaborations. But 
Last but not least, those, bo those uh, two aspects are really drivers for us, uh, opening our, our technology and, and being compliant with the regulator. But, we, but our main pro purpose, especially for the Chief Security Office, is to keep, uh, to keep up with the risk. And um, so, as we see, and especially during the COVID times, we see the rise on ransomware, we see the rise on phishing and, um, and, 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 and APT, so it's uh, a criminal world is really increasing. And I think one of those challenges over there is really the people that we, uh, that we not only have to, to comply to regulators, that we open, have to open our technology, but that we have to educate and aware our people as well. Yes, I think one of the previous speakers said 30% of people did not know what phishing was, so still, still some work to do. Um, okay, thank you. Um, Ramsey, maybe just to go, to go back to you. So we, we, we're talking openness, um, APIs, etc. You, you work for, um, for Luxub, which is the, I hope I can say this, the, the Luxembourg equivalent of, of uh, Isabel Group, right? Uh, more or less. I'm probably offended both Each companies now. Each has its uh, <laughs> own specificities, but yes, kind of. So, so as, a, as a trusted um, orchestrator of, of all these interactions between banks and, and, and banks outside also to, of the banking sector to, to, to fintechs, to corporates, um, are you seeing that evolution? Are you seeing more interaction, number one? And, and number two, is that then affecting what, what banks might become or what a bank, if, if there's still such a thing in the future, would, would, would be in the, you know, in, in the distant future? Is, is a bank becoming a, a super app or is it going to be an ecosystem of small niche banks? Um, so I just All have five that. questions at you. But. Uh, to start with the first part of the question, so um, since LexHub has been created based on the um, compliance for PSD2, so we've seen the power of APIs. Um, I mean, we can uh, talk a lot about uh, how flawed the uh, start was, but uh, at the end, I think we're, we're starting to see results. I believe the UK market is a little bit ahead, but there we see a, a big traction with, I think, over 4 million uh, users of open banking just for payment. So um, we tried to, in general, also with the, uh, with the help of banks and the, the willingness of banks to sort of extend those uh, from just the ability to access your account or initiate payment to more using APIs as a sort of uh, as a channel to connect uh, those new services, whether they are provided by banks themselves or by other players. But I believe um, APIs will be, are already and will be a, a key cornerstone for those uh, for this future. As for how those banks will evolve, I think um, there is a place for all kinds of business models of um, setups of banks. Some will be like smaller, no physical presence, all digital. Uh, some will be completely embedded in different uh, other merchant services and uh, touch points. Others will be super apps and so on. So I believe there will be no one winning model for bank, but will be multitude of banks. Uh, that's a breakthrough compared to what we've seen so far with the model of huge banks that try just to expand geographically, try to open as many agencies as possible. I think in the digital space and with the innovation, there's a space for all kinds of uh, setups. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, when you talk about embedded finance, I think what, what Marc Lenier was showing earlier of of some of these uh, things embedded in browsers, that's that's certainly one of the one of the routes I see for the future. Um, if we just take a step back, what, what has historically been, if we focus on banks, what has historically been the, the role of a bank? It's that of a of a trusted intermediary, trusted custodian. Um, if we now think of the future, or which is already here, uh, openness, APIs, standardized data, um, digitized or digitalized uh, assets, tokenized assets. You know, do, do, do we, Mark, do we, do we still need a bank uh, or, or can we just run everything on a blockchain? Because that's what I just described. I would like first to say something. A few hundred years ago, when the people thought that the earth was flat, it was very difficult for them to imagine that they could make a round of the world trip. A few ten years ago, at Kodak board, 
someone was laughing. Can you imagine that one day where we watch pictures on a TV screen? Ha, 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 not over a dead body. And in fact, uh, the most important thing is change and to adapt to the change. And exactly as you said, you've got to adapt. And I'm quite sure that the future is really bright for the banks, but for the one that will be able to adapt to the new scenarios that are coming. Most of the people, and I'm quite sure to make a bet, do not understand really what means disintermediation. When you said banks are the trusted party, tomorrow each of you will be the trusted party. That will be the blockchain. I will explain another day exactly what it means uh, that. But it means also that you will not need any counterparty to make a, a transaction. If I am sending you 50 euros, I don't need a bank to say, OK, Mark has paid 50 euros to Karin, oh, my sister. Um, so I don't need a bank. It will be from my wallet to her wallet, and it will be written all over the world in many notes. So that means that we do not need any intermediary of trust. So that means that the banks will have another job. Their job will be to make credit, to help you make investments, to know about you. But all these things are materialized with the digital euro. We don't speak about Bitcoin. Bitcoin is something else. Uh, it may be fun, but uh, it's something else. Digital euro, Christine Lagarde, it's a crypto euro. It's a crypto currency. So that means that when I will send to Karin 50 euro, she will receive it immediately in her wallet. I don't need a bank. I don't need a notary. That will mean also that when you will own something, it will be just your ID card with your car license number that will be linked. Nobody has got to testify it. It will be written everywhere. So that means that the bank is changing and all the banks have to think about what the digital euro will bring because tomorrow, for some of you that have got some money at the bank, you will have a choice. Should I put my money at a bank with a bankruptcy risk because there is always a bankruptcy risk and I've got to pay for that. And on the other side, I've got the, digit, uh, the European Central Bank, which normally could not make bankrupt, could not go bankrupt, and the account will be free of charge. So the consumers will have to make a choice. Should I go for a free account or a pay account? No risk, a small risk. So it will bring a lot of disruption in the financial sectors in the coming years. So that's the future, that seems logic. And the banks will benefit of it because the banks Let's say Belfius. Belfius is very well known for um, credit for the people who want to buy a house. So we, as investors, we know that they do their job very well. They choose very carefully their customers. They know very well how to take a guarantee. And they will ask to the customer two or three percent. What they will say on the blockchain, they say, hey, we've got a lot of customers. If you fund us, we will pay you something in return. So you will have the decentralized finance, the DeFi that we all speak about, and we will have the banks acting as actor of the banking industry. That's my vision of the future. I think it's fascinating, fascinating. Um, we're, we're now really getting to the topic of, of the future. Um, maybe one, one additional question um, to, to, to whoever here in, in, in the panel, maybe Mark or, or Karin, but when, when we talk about that, um, and, and, and again, I've, I've, I've run a regulated bank before, immediately the, the challenge of regulation comes up, right? Because what you describe is fantastic in theory. Uh, it's moving forward in, in practice. But can the regulation adapt, follow, um, or even front run? And we've had, we've had some interesting uh, we, opening speeches from our, our, our Deputy Prime Minister. We all have the same DNA. It's AML, D5, it's FT, it's KYC, it's KYT, it's BAL, it's MIFID. Mm. We all have the same DNA. Mm. No, the only concern is that the competition is done through internet. Mm. So that means that if you want to buy something in the United States or in uh, China or in Africa, you just go on the website and if you look at the differences of service and you say, hey, they offer me much more uh, options in, a in a, let's say in Singapore than in Europe, and I'm not forbidden to do it. So for us, the complexity of the regulation challenge is to find a way to protect effectively the consumer on one side, but stay competitive on the worldwide uh, scale. And that will be a real challenge. 
Um, yes, I agree with that. And I think um, it's a challenge, but we ha faced already quite a lot of, of, of challenges. And I think to face these uh, challenges of the future, we have to work around three axes. And it's technology, and it's uh, processes, and, and those people. Um, first of all, about technology, um, like I said, we are, we are taking down that fortress and we are creating openness towards our partners. So we have to adapt our technology mm. and um, we have to, 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 in, to reinvest and to rethink our strategy. And in fact, our strategy before was the defense in depth to, to keep everybody out. Now we are going and evolving more and more to a zero trust strategy where we have to verify and, and, to, con and to be in control. That's, that's one thing. And there, uh, on that part, on the te te technology part, I think it's very important to, to partner with people like Microsoft and other big tech uh, companies to, to evolve in that kind of technology. Mm. Second thing is, uh, of course, the, the, the process and the process around being um, able to comply to all those regulations. But um, that's, that's, it's, it's important to, to also over there that, that the other side, let's say, it's, it's a bit naughty to say, but that they understand that we are uh, quite uh, regulated, mm. but we can find each other in, in a way. We can, I'm, I'm, I'm really hopeful that we, can, that we can collaborate and we'll need the big and the fintechs in order to, to, to evolve like uh, Marek says and like uh, Gabriela says. So also there, I think that we uh, will be able to create processes that, that uh, prove that we are in control of our security, that we are in control of what we are doing and that we can do it end-to-end uh, -end from, from a banking side up till a third party um, side. So that's, uh, that's another thing. And then the third thing, I think we'll, we really have to uh, join our forces regarding the, the, the people around it, our, our customers, our workforce, because um, with joint forces, we can bring them to a more mature level of, of, uh, of being aware what cybercrime is, because for most of the people, it's still science fiction, what you see in the, in, in, in the movies, but it's, it's unfortunate day to day. So taking those, Ali, um, working on those technology um, uh, things and, and working on those processes to have end-to-end -end processes over banking and, uh, and, and going back to, and, and going to those third parties and bringing more and more uh, the security and, 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 and the reality to, to this. I, I think we only can do this if we collaborate and uh, if we work on it together. So, Xavier, if I, if I may, uh, can you guys hear me? Cool. Um, just to sort of, just to extend upon those points, I mean, you, you're seeing, you know, the evolution of the transactional nature. So a very good example would be if you have a look at sort of core banking systems, you know, they're fundamentally designed to prevent any form of access to data with the exception of auditors. And now we live in a world where, you know, it's the complete opposite. So we've seen that transformation, that shift, if you will. But I think that there's the transactional nature that was mentioned there, the intermediary of trust, um, decentralization of finance, but there's also the piece around evolving and, and rapid innovation of the services that are provided to the end customer. One of the advantages that banks have, of course, is the consumer reach that they have with millions and millions of customers that if you're a fintech, take significant amount of marketing and awareness, et cetera, to get to that point. So there's a combination of partnerships that can occur to, again, maintain that evolution of products and services, but also the breadth, you know, covering both transactional and non-transactional through maybe a super app or through a marketplace experience or ecosystems that can be possible through the bank partnering with fintechs, et cetera. Ramsey, you wanted to add uh, something? I just wanted to add maybe a fourth point to Kain's three, um, <laughs> which is the regulator themselves. So I think um, regulation for anyone who works in, in financial industry, 
um, they know how much of barriers to entry they represent for fintechs, but also how like big part of the uh, functioning and costs of a, of a bank, for example. And I think um, there sometimes we have the feeling that the regulators forget about this user experience and user journey. So they design rules and regulations and they may make them more and more complicated at the end. It fits no one, not the user, end users, not the, the financial actors, whether they are big or, and existing or new and innovative. So I think that there is there an improvement to be done in order to kind of make the future of banking or fintechs also um, uh, brighter and more geared towards uh, users and consumers uh, and not just to exist uh, as laws and directors. Yeah, and I think from my, my personal experience on, on the payment side that there's a lot of progress already made there. I think on the, for example, on the wealth tech side, it's, uh, it's still quite challenging. Uh, I remember building some, uh, some wealth tech platforms and, and indeed the, 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 the two click that uh, Marc Linné was referring to is, is quite impossible with the, <laughs> with the regulation that's there still today. Um, I'm just looking at the time. Um, I wanted to, to ask you guys also about, uh, you guys and ladies, sorry, about, um, about ESG. Um, we see green bonds, you know, we talk about a lot of about technology, but, but banking is, is more than that. We talk, uh, you know, there are green bonds uh, being, being issued. The, the, the ESG is, is used to be something to think about, like one of the verticals. It's now really all, all across the, the, the bank and the financial sector. So maybe if I can combine two things, maybe ask you to conclude each one of you um, one or two minutes on what is, you know, trying to answer the question, which I think is impossible, but ha have a go. Um, this is the moment to be wildly uh, creative. What is the bank of the future? Is it a fully embedded um, thing? Is it a completely decentralized thing? Is it, you know, a combination thereof? Uh, and maybe if, if, you, if you have some thoughts on, on the ESG part, um, because I, I, I think the, w the way the sector is, is going probably has already gone. ESG is only present and, and it's, only, it's only going to stay and, and, and get stronger. So um, no particular order, maybe. <laughs> well, uh, ladies first, if I'll you want start, to start. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'm not really futurist, but um, I think that it will be a combination of uh, all possibilities, including blockchain. Um, and I'd like to see in the future better uh, usage of data and AI so you get really a better customer view, a behavior of customers so you can advise them better because no person can process as much of data as AI. So instead of getting a banker advising you, you should be able to get your personalized advice, like, for example, how much do I need to save for my pension? Uh, how much do I need to put aside for savings and so on? And perhaps same for the company, some predictions. So certainly more and more data and AI being used and pro probably banks going more cloud so can, they can leverage on all the technology mm. available. Um, and collaborate in better way, and um, yeah, focus focus on what they're the strongest, which I believe is more the back end and the regulatory part, and leave the tech people to work on the customer uh, experience side. Um, and as for SEG, um, I, I I like the concept very much. I think that's a good direction, um, but there's a probably still a big question mark because report do say that uh, G20 countries, um, financial institutions, still hold 20% of their loans and investments in highly intense uh, carbon industry and what to do with that because if they uh, go down rapidly it would have a huge impact on financial institutions at this point. Thank you, Mark. Uh, as I come from the telecom industry, um, I had a, a previous life where I was uh, the founder of one of the first uh, uh, alternative telecom uh, companies in Belgium. It was in 1996, so it was a long time ago. And um, we have seen a lot of new telecom companies opening up all over Europe. 
and the incumbents were there. So exactly the same situation now where you see all these new banks with new products and uh, they got to disrupt the world and they will change the world. But have a look at what happened in the telecom industry. The incumbent players are still there. It's more an oligopoly and you will see a lot of smaller companies developing special needs according to the uh, needs of the customer and the most important thing is the consumer, the customer and if you, will, you want to have a bank as, uh, which is international, gives you access to many services, you will buy it for the services and the one you will buy it because it's integrated within, with your job, with your, the, the insurances and so on. So you will have specialized services uh, for sure. The next step will be the aggregation of the market because all of those banks will not survive, the incumbent, yes, but all the smaller banks are trying to get bigger and bigger, will not survive, we'll have new actors, but uh, I'm quite sure that the main difference will come from the consumer itself and the decentralization of finance, but I'm quite sure that the decentralization of finance won't be possible with the traditional finance because of regulation, because of uh, uh, money laundering and uh, the, the fight against the anonymity, which is the, the real threat is the anonymous side of the people. So decentralized finance cannot exist without centralized finance. And everything consumes a lot, a lot, a lot of energy. But there are a lot of new technologies, mainly blockchain technologies, uh, that are using less and less energy. When we speak about Bitcoin, yes, it was huge, but the new technologies uh, spend some 50,000 times less than the Bitcoin technology and allow to have tens of thousands of transactions per minute. So the new system, the new transaction system will be used by the traditional banks, by the new banks and for sure all these uh, new uh, service providers, should I name them, even if they've got the word bank in their, uh, in their uh, name. Um, for me, the key words uh, towards the future is collaboration. Uh, collaboration in order to to, to, to make this uh, digital transformation happening and um, and the most important thing within this digital uh, transformation for for me as a chief security officer is keep our customers safe so and I think uh, when we can collaborate on with with the policy makers with uh, the the big and the fintech and, and with uh, different partners that we can uh, cope with these challenges. And, and given some of the, the activities of, of Bellevue's outside of the sector of banking, do you, do, you, do you have any views on that? I don't know if you can comment, but you know, beyond banking, so is, is, do you see that as, as, do you see the bank staying a traditional bank as it is today, or do you see that uh, evolving you know, into the telco yeah. sector, uh, into other sectors, and completely yeah. embed finance? Uh, it, it, in my view, finance will become ubiquitous, right? It will become... Yeah, I think the bank will be, integ uh, like uh, the previous speaker said, it's, it integrates more and more into the world of, 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 of the customers. Yeah. And uh, I liked very much the, the, the bold.com uh, thing of, of Marek. And that's, in fact, our added value. We have to... Um, we, we, we have to guide our customers and give added value and not uh, like just for just a transaction. Maybe like Marek says, we, we don't need a bank anymore in the future, but, but it's the, the, we have to create that added value for our customers. Thank you very much. Um, maybe just to try not to reiterate uh, some important keywords like collaboration, I think. To enable this collaboration, the, the bank of the future it needs to be more agile, or agile, um, just to be able to get into new partnerships faster, try new things, expose new services, new APIs, try fintech services, um, just to move on towards this uh, better customer experience, and then. Um, from a marketing perspective, I think the, the bank of the future needs to have a, a more unique positioning. Today's banks are a little bit more or less very similar. In the future, they would have a very unique value propositions geared towards very specific uh, targets, and uh, that will help them also uh, uh, build the right tools and find the right uh, models in, in order to empower them. Great. Thank you, Ramsey. Okay. Steve, last but not least, you, you have a very global perspective. You work with companies, all <laughs> banks all over the world. Yeah. So, 
What do you I think? mean, I think I, I sort of, so I was going to address your, your question around ESG. So one of the things that we do with customers is very much work with them around their own uh, ESG or sustainability strategy, but also in the context of FSI customers is around providing services to their customers. So at COP, we announced the uh, Microsoft Cloud for Sustainability, and we're working with a lot of banks around how can they create sort of marketplace models around sort of you know carbon offsetting, and how can they provide products and services to their customers, their business customers or retail customers to better understand their sustainability, but also make changes for the greater good of the, of the you know of the globe. So that's something is that you know being a regulated industry is absolutely critical to all of us being you know living in a better world. So I think ESG and sustainability should be a really big focus of all the financial services uh, taking part today. Great, thanks. And any views on the bank of the future? In, in we, we, have, uh, we, have, we have three minutes left, I, th I think I can see on the three time. Three minutes. <laughs> um, so I think, I think, as I said, it's just, uh, you know, creating, you know, these new digital experiences, new customer experiences that allow you to support, empower what you're trying to do, support your life events, whether they're planned or unplanned. And that, for me, is really sort of what we're starting to see the evolution of. And again, reiterating the points of the panel, this partnership between banks and fintechs is definitely the way forward. Yeah, thanks. I think well, you, you, you talked about core banking systems. Um, I've, I've looked at a few of them, a number of them actually, and what, what you see there is actually they, well, they, obviously they've evolved from on-prem to, 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 to cloud-based, et cetera, but and what, what, what struck me is that most of them now have what I call an app store uh, of, of fintechs and, and other types <laughs> of providers. Right? The, 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 the easy integration. Right. Uh, is is there already, uh, or at least I'm, I don't know, don't know if it's always really there, but at least it's certainly promoted. And in Correct. Of collaboration. Yeah, and we certainly see that with, with partners like Terminos and Finastra, and and you know the the the, the, the you know the digital players, man, we thought machine, absolutely that we're all working together to make it far easier to interoperate and to be integrated for the. So great point. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, thank you much, very much to all the panelists. Thank you to, um, to, to the audience. Uh, I hope we, 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 we gave you a bit of a glimpse of what the future could hold. Um, many different theories. So I think we'll have to come back here many years to, to see how it really pans out. Thank you very much. Thank you.